Wireless food. Nobody uses tomatoes. Oh. Anyway. Yes. From like um, a cup of So I like suppose this is uh, a talk about OC and TS 3D and whatever. Except I have no idea what to talk about. So the first question would probably be: uh, Are there any there people go. here who? kind of need to know or want to know anything specific about OC that hasn't been talked about by Payonel before. If yes, then we can pick that up as a topic and I can talk about that a bit. If not... To be fair, his explanation was very, very good. That's the point, yeah. So I don't think there's much to add on the, at least on the software side anyway. Um, and on the hardware side, there were a few changes, but I think I covered most of that in the talk on last BTM. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, there's videos of that, and I don't think, I yeah. think for most of it would be boring to just recap that. TSOC is yeah. just a lazy concatenation of TS 3D and OC. So it's <laughs> no, no deeper meaning behind that. Um, Otherwise, um, we can talk about TIS 3D a bit. Um, yeah, right, just in chat. So if you have any questions, if there's anything at all you want, would, want, would like me to talk about, um, just write. Um, so TIS 3D, do you know about that one? Because if you don't, that's the newer one of my two mods, which is kind of neat, I think. Um, okay, so, hmm. nobody says anything. Say yes or no, please, anyone. Do you know it or not? It's too much effort to type or what? The effort porting D. from 1A to 1.9, um, not that bad, actually. I mean, from 1.7 to 1.8. Yes, that was a pain. That's what I... But exactly because of mostly because of all the render changes. Mm. But from one eight to one nine, that wasn't really that much effort. I mean, still there were a few changes, obviously, but uh, it wasn't that bad. The actual problem I kind of have now, or I feel I now have with OC, is that it has gone through so many ports for so many versions that there's a lot of code <laughs> in there that is just old and uses mechanisms in sort of not the way you do them today. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, at the, at the very moment, that's obviously capabilities. So everything now goes towards capabilities. So inventories, fluid handling, all that stuff. And I don't think everything in OC is updated to that yet, even. So that's one thing, but also in general, the networking is still kind of hacked together to work in the new network system with Netty. So that would probably need a rewrite more or less uh, soonish. So just today, a player sent me a screenshot of the profiling of the screen initialization sent to the clients. And yeah, that should probably run in uh, async mode and not synchronous. <laughs> But yeah, <laughs> so so those are all the small problems that kind of pile up after a few ports, and mm. those are kind of just annoying because it's not new stuff that you're building. It's just getting old stuff to run again in the way it already did before. Yeah, so that's mm, it's kind of hard to get the motivation up for that after time. Um, TIS 3D porting from well, in general, porting from one one nine to one ten is. It's like no issue at all. I don't even think I had to change anything at all in TI 3D, except for the version number in the MC mod info file. Um, unless there's a core mod anywhere, I don't think in general that there's big issues there. Um, bup, 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 bup. Mumble, OC2, yeah, so um, I suppose, I mean, I think there was a nope for the TIS 3D before, before so uh, I, c I will go into that real quick. And I also have creative mode, haha, <laughs> so I can build something if I find the tab. Um, so TI3D is kind of a super low level programming mod, so to say. So uh, unlike open computers where you have pretty much a high level stuff going on, let's pick a redstone, um, this is more of 
a better way of, or, well, a different way of um, building what you usually do perhaps with redstone circuitry. So the whole mod consists of two blocks, the controller block and the casing block. And yes, the programming is done in sort of assembly. So if you know the game Atia S100, um, it's very much inspired by that. I basically played that and thought, huh, how would that work if it were in 3D? And this mod is basically the result of that thought. So what you have is you have a controller block and casing blocks, and you can arrange those casings in any way you wish. And on each face of a casing, you can slot in modules. And the most flexible one is the execution module, which can be used to run assembly code, basically. So the dialect of the assembly is pretty much the one used in TRS-100, the game, for which there's a manual that you can download somewhere. And it's also described in the uh, in-game manual of the mod a bit. So, oh god, I don't even know the... Neat. <laughs> know the, know the lingo myself anymore. But basically what you do is you... Whoa, what the... Uh, what you do is program this, so there's a book that... So you can use the vanilla books, but as we all know, those are terrible to work with because you can't yes. go back in your whatever you wrote. You have to delete everything to change something. So the mod has a alter alternative to that, which is also a book, but which um, has basically a much nicer code editor, which also does highlighting on errors and stuff. So uh, on the left one here, I told it to just move the value. Oh, you have something down there. What? No, I don't want that. Um, let's use this there. And then, oh, now the screens will turn off. Whatever. Anyway, um, do that away. Do that away. So the execution module on the front will now just shove the value three to the right, and oops, and the one to the right will move whatever it reads from the left to below it. And now, if we have a lever somewhere, so basically the whole thing runs sort of off redstone. So oh, thank you. So as long as it has a signal. Uh, it turns on and it executes, and now the wire down here gets the value 3 as a signal strength from mm -hmm. these two modules. And so basically using these assembly modules you can write small programs which do control logic, uh, which you usually do perhaps with either redstone, but rather large redstone contraptions, or perhaps using some small computer, but maybe that would be overkill. So this is kind of the middle ground for that. So yeah, that's that mod. There's also a few more modules. So there's modules for displaying stuff, for memory, for outputting audio signals. Um, so basically the note block signals. Um, a keypad for data input. Uh, an infrared module for sending packets over the air. And stuff like that. So yeah, that's the newer mod. And that's it's, it's kind of compact and I want to keep it that way. Um, in particular because Porting is just so much easier when the mod is not super huge, like OC has grown. So this was really, I mean, I started it in 1.9, I think, and backported it to 1.7, but that was really no big effort at all. Versus updating OC from 1.7 to 1.8 was like a huge pain. So yeah, anyway, that's that. Um, but I think I also mentioned that already in the last talk, so not much more to add here. So the second question somewhere, let's see. Someone wrote OC2 question. Um, so yeah, there's currently some brainstorming going on as to kind of a spiritual successor of Open Computers, but I'm, I'm kind of hesitant to call it Open Computers too, because from what I'm currently thinking, it will not be much like Open Computers in the way it works directly, because it will be more focused on lower level implementation. So it will kind of be fit in between TIS3D and Open Computers, so to say. So basically the idea would be that the mod provides some kind of virtualization framework and then add-ons on the mod itself provides components that run in this framework. So it's not like, okay, there's basically Lua and then there's a hologram and then you call a function and everything is dandy. 
and it's more like uh, there's a data bus with actual um <laughs> no not floss computers um <laughs> With well, a data bus and an address bus, and well, you write basically values to a memory mapped region, and processors actually work the way they would in real world. So uh, the first thing, for example, I would like to try and get to run on this framework is some older processor like an 8080, and see if that works. And if it does, then expand the framework to support more different uh, processors, basically. And again, it would be pretty much multi-block focused. So it probably would be even more multi-block focused than open computers now in the sense that, for example, RAM would also be a block which would connect to a data bus, which is just a cable then. And to encourage that, I w would like to... Um, yeah, actually, I have to admit, I never played with Raspberry Pi 2 computers. Um, but I, I, what I've read people talk about is that it kind of was like that, yeah. But basically, um, not only have one architecture, but multiple different architectures, and those all work together. Anyway, um, but to encourage that, I kind of would like to have some way to make it easier to remote control things. So right now if you have um open computers and then you will have like your, your base and then you have the react reactor somewhere far off so it doesn't explode in your base if you want to control that then you usually usually have a second uh, computer at the reactor and maybe um, have wireless networking or something like that and with this i'd kind of like to encourage having one central mainframe and have that control various things all over the world and provide some ways of connecting that more easily. Uh, among other things, to avoid having multiple computers in the world, which kind of tends to be not so good for performance anyway. Mm. So yeah, that's kind of my current thoughts. Um, I have started a bit of coding. Um, there's nothing really that I can show yet. Uh, there's nothing I've pushed to GitHub yet. Um, it's more like yeah, something between that, yeah, between OC and TIS. Um, I, I also wanted to write some more, um, well, a kind of library code, basically. So this comes again into the so, so common question, why does every modder have his own library? Um, well, it's mostly because people don't want to be dependent on other people's code. And it's the same for me, basically. So sure, there are other people who have written the libraries and made them open source and stuff, but it's often still small things that just don't seem intuitive to some to to me, or so maybe it's just a different way of thinking, and so it's easier to just write your own library. So that's just some basic fundamentals I'm, I've been working on recently, and those are kind of done now. So I've started prototyping some of the uh, new mechanics. And it's already going much faster and easier if you don't have to write the same boilerplate code for every tile and TT again and again, for example. So mm -hmm. I think it's already been worth that time investment of uh, writing that small library. And over the time, if that proves to be working well, I might even look into adjusting possibly open computers, um, more likely TIS3D because it's not so massive to also use um, some of these systems in that library then. So those include, um, on the one hand, a basically a component system. So um, the main advantage of that is I've basically just from, from working with component systems in my day job, I've been getting used to the way of thinking with those. So it's not like you have entities and those extend stuff and those extend stuff. So it's more of a composition-based uh, system. So you have um, a location and then you say, okay, and this also can interact with Redstone and this is an inventory and it's just a few classes that you plug together and it magically works. And that makes things quite a bit easier. And the other big advantage is that it makes um, interacting from the server with the client easier if you have a common ID on the server and the client. So for entities in Minecraft, this is already the case because Minecraft itself tracks those entities, but for example, for tile entities, you always would have to go through the dimension and the coordinates of the tile entity to send something from the server to the client. 
which, for example, in OC was a huge pain because of moving robots. So if there is enough lag, the server could send a package to mm -hmm. the client or the other way around. So if the client says, okay, I have input for the tile entity at that location. And then the server says, well, there is no tile entity here because the robot already moved. So I kind of had a, a, a system along those lines already. I'm glitching? Oh, God. How Not bad anymore. is it? Not. How bad is it? I don't know. Is it getting better? Seems like it's fine again for me at least. Yeah, yeah, it's okay. understandable though. Okay. Uh, okay. Mm -hmm. I'll just keep going. No, you restart something. Do I have to wait? What is it then? Okay, I'll wait. Yeah, let's wait. Mm. Meanwhile. <laughs> Meanwhile. Meanwhile, game of life. Oh, there we go. Going back. We're back. We're back What's in wrong the room. Mumble. Awesome. Everyone back? Everything better? Sounds like it. Good. All right. So where was I? All right. Yes. Uh, so that's the one part. And the other part is basically a system for making those easier to serialize, basically. So not having to write for each and every tile entity, you write in BT, read in BT with the tags and the name and the type and the and everything. So mm -hmm. basically I just have now a system where I put an attribute over a field and then it automat automatically gets serialized, which of course runs through reflection, but it's only for the reading and the writing. So it's pretty fast. It's fast enough anyway for now. Mm -hmm. We'll see when the next BTM happens and when it's ready for testing there, if it's still fast enough, but yeah. Anyway, so that's just some stuff to make life easier while writing the mods. So you just don't have don't have that much friction while, um, while doing what you want to do. Yeah, anyway, so that's the, the prep work I've been doing and now I've been prototyping a bit and uh, implementing the basic bus systems and now I'm seeing, uh, dug out an old uh, emulator for an 8080 I had lying around and trying to get that to run now. And when it does, we'll see. I'll probably push it to GitHub one of the other days and get some feedback from other people. And then we'll see where it goes from there. So Neat. that's the next up thing. But that's also the reason why I've been kind of um, quiet on the OC side recently, because actually most of the time I had that I still felt like coding my free time, which has been getting less, um, went into that and not into OC. But we'll see how that will develop. I mean, I'm, I'm happy that, um, for example, Payonel now takes care of all the Lua side stuff now. That's a huge help. And Vexatos has been helpful in doing a few pull requests recently, so maybe he'll um, get more active in fixing stuff. <laughs> 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 yes. uh, anyway. So yeah, uh, I totally didn't look in the chat. Any more questions? Questions, questions. No, any more questions? Will I see you with custom CPUs architecture support pre-compiled software in the future? Um, depending on the architecture, it uh, already does. So, I mean, um, for Lua, it probably never will because the bytecode is, when compiled, can do evil things. And using the native libraries, those are the execution of the natives, obviously, isn't itself sandbox, just the Lua that runs inside them. So loading bytecode in those would pretty much allow escaping the sandbox. 
So in Lua, no. But in other architectures, for example, um, the ARM ones and the MIPS one and whatever else there is, those basically run compiled code. So yes. So if you can get like a binary file on there, you can run it. Oh. Oh, uh, essentially, if it if it's a binary file for that architecture, yes. Mm -hmm. There had to be at least one crash during this panel. Of course. <laughs> If there wasn't a crash, something was wrong. Yeah. <laughs> well, we did have to restart Mumble. But... Hmm. So you mentioned that... But it isn't that... as real as in-game crashes. <laughs> I mentioned? That huh? you would have one central mainframe for the TIS. Would you be willing to share more about that? Uh, all right. Um, well, that's more of a design goal for me basically now. I don't have any actual specific concepts of how to solve that, so how to make it easier to remote control stuff. I mean, the obvious easiest solution would be a peer-to-peer -peer thing that just works remotely, magically, and allows you to connect stuff. Um, the way I kind of hope it would work is that you have some way of um, binding actual displays to a graphics card or something and have multiple ones bound to that so that you don't have actual tablets mm. right now that you carry around but more like the remote terminals in OC where you still communicate with the central system but you can access it, access it, access it from pretty much anywhere so that you don't feel like you have to walk back all the time if you need to test something on the other end is obviously having um, stationary components that are somehow connected to the central system and can be controlled from there. But yeah, the, so the, the main idea is to have the whole system be a bit more blocky, but to avoid that being a pain in the ass, um, make it easier to access it and from from anywhere and control anything anywhere. Awesome. Any more questions? Question is the server backup. Yes. Server yeah. Server is up. Hey, hey, hey. And, and the game of life is. What are the running. available tools for um, like software, um, like ecosystem for, or like pulling in you know things from different sources? It, it seems like that. Uh, that's been one of the things I've had. I'm finding is a lot, a lot of third party tools and programs people have written. Uh, for Lua or for for the Lua. So in so inside the virtual machine um, so I mean the main main repository probably is uh, open programs for because the but mainly just because OPPN exists and that pulls from that so if people have any libraries they want to share it's generally a good idea to put it on there and that makes it a lot easier for people to load it in the game um, via OPPM uh, as for other sources um, I mean there is the forum though I mean, well, it's it's kind of slow going, I think, but it still exists and people post stuff there. So there's that. And as a not ultimately persistent source, but always a place where, well, you can ask if things exist or if someone knows something about it is always IRC. So I think that's basically the, the main a source of knowledge if you want to know anything about OC that isn't, uh, or yeah, well, generally OC uh, that isn't documented anywhere. If you ask in OC, there's pretty much always someone there who will probably know an answer. Right on. Um, I had another question was on the uh, the implementation of the video, the graphics cards, the mm -hmm. uh, the way the 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 API from the Lua side transferring to the the front end seems like in order to write any kind of like advanced user interface, like a, I don't know, like a TurboVision. I remember back DOS days, I used to write TurboVision apps and I, I've always wanted to kind of write a TurboVision sort of like IDE that would, you know, like a Borland style IDE mm -hmm. for inside of computer craft. It seems like, or inside of open computers, the, um, it seems like the, the interface ends up a lot of bandwidth in order to do any move or scroll a sword. Or, um, update the, the the color of an area versus the the text on it. Is there any advancements to those APIs planned? Kinda? 
Uh, so there's been, I mean, the so the, the first thing to say about the API as it currently stands is that the main design goal behind it was basically to make it hard to abuse actual network bandwidth by doing multiple writes or reads to the graphics card. And I think that works out pretty well, but at the cost of sometimes it being a bit of a hassle to get things to work easily the way you usually like to them the work. Um, so as for, re re uh, as for reworks, there's been multiple discussions going on and multiple ideas. There's been, I think, three issues on GitHub that have been sort of uh, merged into one now uh, with ideas for a different implementation of a graphics card. So I think the current state that is kind of the general favorite uh, would work kind of in the way that there would be some kind of VRAM that um, while writing to it as is would not be ultimately that fast, but that then there should be uh, shaders, so to say, that could run on the client side and that would operate on the VRAM and um, manipulate, manipulate that before it's actually getting rendered. So basically there would be a hot state and that would be synchronized between between server and client. But then that would also still be a processing step happening on the client, which would allow for very fast operations Neat. and very smooth animations and stuff like that, which would not persist ultimately, which would only happen on the client. And um, yeah, so that's basically the, the current more or less consensus. But I don't think anyone has actually started working on something like that yet. It's more of like the current uh, concept that is kind of agreed upon, I think. All right, thanks. Sure. Any more questions? Is there any uh, difference between the different um, architectures uh, from a programming perspective? Um, that depends on the architectures. Um, in the Lua ones, uh, not so much. There's a few differences between 5.2 and 5.3. In particular, uh, in 5.3, there are a um, few more operations uh, on, well, so there's the bitwise operations, which uh, have extra operators now. So those didn't exist in 5.2. And those are particularly useful when doing, well, also when doing graphics operations. So this is, for example, why most of AC's demo programs used 5.3, because they used those operations. So when you do bit masking, for example, it's a lot easier and cleaner to write with 5.3 because you can just use those operators and instead of having to use the bit library from 5.2. Also, it's faster than using the library because operators are always faster than uh, method calls. Yes, exactly. Um, as for Lua versus other uh, architectures, yes, of course, there's a much bigger difference. So um, the Lua architectures obviously only run Lua code and those are interpreted pretty much high-level languages. While well, there are also some architectures which are much more low-level and those run actual machine code, so to say. I mean, they're also, also interpreted or emulated, but it's um, the programs have to be actually compiled to work on those. Uh, what's my favorite thing that someone has done with OC and what's something you'd like to see done that you know for sure is possible given what you've worked on for OC through this far. Additionally, what can we expect from OC in future updates? Um, I think the favorite thing I've seen so far is still the uh, in-game streaming that AC did and Greaser did <laughs> for the last BTM. That was just mind-blowing for me. That was great. Because, I mean, I, I, st I also fell into this preconception that the screens are kind of not super fast, but I've just accepted it because, well, because the network bandwidth limitations and not wanting to break those. Um, and then seeing something like that was pretty, pretty awesome. Um, wanting to see something not done. Hmm. Hmm. <laughs> I don't think I've seen people use drones to do anything l very large, massive scale yet. So that would uh -huh. be kind of interesting to see if someone could um, automate a complete factory of that. If that's already been done, I've not seen it yet. Uh, if someone has a link, that would be awesome. Um, and what I'd expect, what can we expect in the future? Um, I'm actually not super sure. Um, among other things, because I've kind of 
have too much fun uh, thinking about and working on, let's call it OC2. So I'm sure what I would definitely like to get done is, um, well, just clean up essentially. So what I mentioned before, um, moving more stuff to using capabilities at the, as they should, um, rewriting parts of the network code to work better and faster, um, stuff like that. And hopefully one day uh, the long, long discussed and talked about graphics card upgrade update thing. Uh, what kind of open computers projects can you recommend for people new to programming? Um, so basically you mean what what tasks to set themselves for programming something? Um, I mean, the, the what I call the hello world of uh, Minecraft uh, or computer mods in Minecraft is basically a big reactor control program. Yeah. <laughs> so those have been done like sand on the uh, beach. But anyway, um, <laughs> other than that, uh, I think generally robot automation is something that's very nice for getting started because it's so visual and you get immediate feedback. So if you tell your robot to move forward, it moves forward and you just see that happening. So I think that's while it takes a few of the more advanced components in the mod, it's still one of the most relatable things to program for in the mod. Uh, mm. Is there any chance of seeing a client side sort of screen for demos to reduce network use? Um, so kind of if the graphics card implementation changes would allow for that. I mean, if the client side, let's call it shaders, would be powerful enough to do that, then yes, that would definitely be possible. Um, I think the main limitation on those will be that they just can't run for very long because, well, they have to be done in reasonable time for the frame time to not drop and the rendering time not to go, get terrible. Um, mm. And yes, so they would probably not be in Lua. They'd probably some kind of simple, super simple um, assembly thing, language, whatever, with a custom interpreter. <laughs> uh, what was the uh, wouldn't be able to transfer the programs? Ah, okay, yeah. So, so no, um, the idea would not be to have the Lua programs run on the client, but to have something else running there. That would be easier to control because for now, so the Lua uh, sandboxing basically works by hooks in Lua. So Lua has debug hooks, which are called, for example, um, every 10,000 operations or whatever. And that's what OC uses to regularly check if the time limit has exceeded. And that would be, in my opinion, much too um, broad to work well in rendering in the rendering loop. Um, well, it probably wouldn't be GLSL. It's probably something much simpler, but we'll see. I mean, it also depends on who does it and how much time will be spent on it. Yeah. Uh, da, 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 da. Uh, that would be, uh... So for the data, um, as I mentioned, that probably would be like one block of VRAM, which would actually be the hard memory, and that would be transferred to the client, yes, but it would not be modified as is on the client. The client would just um, do changes or operations based on that. And the VRAM probably, well, I don't know, I don't know, maybe, um, could also contain, if it's some sort of um, custom bytecode interpreter, um, the actual shader programs. Or maybe that's a separate slot of memory, I don't know, we'll see. Uh, bup, 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 bup. The sound card, yeah, that's pretty neat. Uh, I saw a quick demo. So uh, is it still in the OC booth? So if, uh, if you haven't seen it yet in the OC booth, there's demos of pretty much everything. Uh, and there's also, oh, so, so that, instructions. Ah, I don't know how that works on the back end. I have no idea. If that is how it works, <laughs> then sure, I guess. I was going to just add a little mention in here. If uh, people are curious about how the uh, shader model kind of works so they understand it, there's a, a really bunch of really nice tools on the on the web, like Shader Toy and like that, that will mm -hmm. give you the mindset to understand how they, how they would work. So if you're interested in going that route, not to yeah. be too off topic. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's a good good point, yeah. Um, yeah, Shader Toy is a pretty great site. <laughs> it's pretty impressive what people do with shaders alone. 
All right. Uh, is there anything else I wanted to talk about? So yeah, anyway, um, I probably will throw out a release candidate of 1.6 finally this weekend. It's totally not like I wanted to have it released last BTM. No, no, no. You must have heard there. Um, but yeah, I probably will throw out a uh, release candidate of 1.6 of LC this weekend. And if nothing terrible breaks anymore, I'll throw out the final release next weekend so that finally that gets out. It's been in development for way too long. Uh, how hard bad idea is would it be to add a CPU architecture supporting JVM bytecode? Um, <laughs> depends on how fast you want it to run. But uh, if you if you if you run it slow enough so it doesn't bog down the server, I mean, okay. why not? Could be interesting. I mean, uh, I don't know how well. I mean, the JVM also obviously would have to have some hooks for how memory is allocated. So I guess you could hook into those to limit that. Yeah, I mean, sure, have fun. <laughs> uh, how level the hardware will be microcontroller transistor so, um, so for the OC2 thing I guess um, it would be pretty pretty low level for now I guess so the current concepts are like um, it's just the, the bus where you actually write um, to fixed addresses and there's no not yet anyway uh, no protocol for high level data so um, that's one of the things I do kind of uh, want to get in there that there's at least some standardized protocols. So, for example, if if there does need to be uh, an extra Lua uh, architecture again um, and it doesn't run, or we can't get mm -hmm. it to run on any of the other architectures, uh, uh, triple sandboxing. Anyway, uh, so if that becomes necessary, then it would be nice to have some sort of protocol running on that bus so that people, when implementing their components, don't have to go that deep because I guess that would be quite um, well deterring for some people because I mean I, and I, I would perfectly understand that so you don't always want to write uh, okay so I now have um, this serial data and I need to read three more bytes then I know how much I have to return but if there's a reset signal then I have to that's not something you want to do usually so that need to be some kind of high level um, protocol defining okay um if i provide this method then um this all of the th stuff happens behind the uh, the curtains for you um so what was the extra question ah right high level so yeah so the actual uh, components by the mod itself would be relatively low level um and the systems behind the curtains but um i hope there to be some api for relatively high level interact uh, interaction too just for usability for the uh, for add-ons and stuff uh was that for me i don't know and reporting that uh, PCI bridges um, I don't know I have no idea um, for now I basically just have a very low level bus and it's one bus and everything runs through that um, we'll see how much we have to expand that uh, what other systems will have to come for that um, I'll probably throw up a repository in github I don't know maybe next month or so um, if you have any ideas or concerns or whatever um, then by all means um, open issues there and um, let me know whatever you think might be necessary would be a good idea would not be a good idea uh, on there then or before that um, just uh, talk to me on rc is the uh is the build steps being open open compute to compile and set up and tribute code uh, difficult or documented um i think it's documented in the readme on the prog uh, in the repository itself it should not it should it should should big should uh, not be too hard um basically it should be clone the repository and then run the general gradle steps for setting up the environment so 
what is it, Gradle um, set up the comp workspace and um, Gradle whatever your IDE is, so mm -hmm. IDEA or Eclipse, and that should be it, actually. So that, that should be all you have to do to um, start working on Open Computers itself. And then, and then, like the uh, Gradle or uh, Clip, or not Gradle, uh, Clip or um, other IDEs, they'll, they'll just launch Minecraft. Uh, you can, yeah, you can run it from inside the IDE. So, uh, running those tasks, those Gradle tasks, will set up the um, the run configurations in the IDE, and then you can just select them there. So, there's, for example, in IDE idea, the IntelliJ idea. There's then the Minecraft client and Minecraft server um, configurations, and you just select those and hit run or debug, and then it'll start that with a mod in it. And you can test okay. and everything. Um, there's a few small um, gotchas. Let me check the uh, repository real quick to see. I think it's documented. Um, boom, 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 boom. Scrolling all the way down. Uh, yeah. Exactly. So uh, on the on the actual side of the uh, repository, let's see. I can probably link this here, right? Oops. So there, um, there's all th all the information you basically need to get it to run, including a few um, extra command line parameters you might want to add if you have, for example, um, other mods in your dev development environment which rely on the simple component system, which uses the class transformer, which has to be passed via the command line for the uh, Forge system to find it and load it. But other than that, it's pretty straightforward. Okay, thank you. Sure. Ah, okay, and apparently uh, IDEA is even smart enough to just loaded it itself now, so you don't even need the second step there. Good to know. Okay. If I didn't miss anything. <laughs> I think there are no more questions. If there are, please write them again, because then I missed them. <laughs> Otherwise, thanks for, well, hearing me talk about this and that um, with no actual plan for, was it actually an hour? No, it can't have been. Since Almost. we were behind schedule, it was a little bit less than an hour. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So for, I don't know, 45 minutes. Yeah. And, yeah, have fun at the remaining panels at BTM.